We are filming in Manhattan today. My name is Monk Rowe with the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Lewis Hayes with me, one of the jazz's great drummers. And, Monk, it's a pleasure being you here. Know, uh, band leader and composer on occasion. It, it's really a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, I was fortunate to see you at the Iridium last night. And some of those tempos were just to talk about hard bop. I mean, very, very hard. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was a lot of fun, and especially uh, starting off the night like that. <laughs> now, when I was much younger, Freddie Hubbard and myself, we used to do that. Uh, what was the tune we used to play? Just one of those things. Uh huh. We used to start off like that. That was uh, nightly, just to uh, get yourself loosened up and get yourself together. A staggering pace, I mean, fast as you could go. And uh, really challenging. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for the bass player sometime, actually, <laughs> when yeah. it goes on and on. But, but yeah. you uh, expend an awful lot of energy, too. Yes. But, but uh, have you ever had a problem with keeping up that for very long? Well, actually, uh, no, I don't, because uh, I practice, and I warm up every day before I come to mm -hmm. a job, and I like practicing. Now, when I was a, a youngster, naturally I had problems keeping up, but once I grew up a little bit and came to, you know, start getting a little older and a little more experienced, and I got to the point where I could handle it, I've never had a problem mm -hmm. since, because I've always uh, stayed in shape. And, and when you practice for a long period of time, then it's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. But naturally, and, and, uh, and I don't spend too much energy for it moving around physically, my head and body and everything. I'm more or less a person that just deals with uh, less motion as possible. Mm. You know. I notice on occasion um, it looks like you're singing or speaking to yourself yes, as you I, play. I, now, see, I noticed that uh, on video cameras. Yeah. I never knew it was coming out like oh, really? that until somebody yeah. videoed me. And is that, <laughs> that is something that just happens. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just... Uh, You're not saying anything specific then? No. Maybe? Okay. No. Although sometimes I might be thinking about I'd be glad when this guy stops so long. I mean, <laughs> I like to go see out there. <laughs> But it's just a facial, I think it's just a facial. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, sometimes it always looked like you were mouthing the melody with the guys, too, uh -huh. which may have happened. But um, I always like to watch that kind of, that, that group. I mean, this, this wasn't a group that works together a lot. No. But on occasion, you guys would, would lay into something. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, I was wondering, like, well, was that rehearsed? Or is that a lick that's kind of standard with a song? Like I wrote one down and it went uh, ba da ba da ba 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 da, and you were playing that with the horns and behind somebody's solo. I can't recall the tune though. I don't know what it could have been because we didn't rehearse. Uh huh. And um, and but it, it is music. This art form, when you know the guys, it does have a language, and everyone who can play on it, you know, knowing each other, play on a certain level. You each, you know the language to uh, to the, the czar form. Yeah. So, it uh, you can do things that the audience might uh, looks like it's been rehearsed, but actually we didn't rehearse. This is the first time, actually, since we've been on this job that we played together. Mm. And uh, McPherson, he lives in San Diego, and it was a bad. Uh, had a lot of problems with the weather when he was coming in, so he, he didn't arrive until, we started open Tuesday, but he re arrived Wednesday. Oh. So we did not do any rehearsing. Uh, yeah, we just, okay. Well, you grew up in a pretty musical atmosphere. Detroit I, I was, was a good city for music in general. Yes. Yes, it really was. I, I, my father played piano and drums, and my mother played piano. And I started out playing piano. Naturally, started out playing piano. Most kids started out playing, you know, because piano was in homes all, you know, mostly. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a while. But the piano to me was uh, at, at five or six. It it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, I think playing, doing anything, if it's uh, too complicated or not fun, 
and someone has to uh, more or less as a job make you do it, that causes a problem. And the piano caused me a problem. But drums were uh, there in the house also, and I started just playing drums, and drums were fun to me. It was actually fun. And I realized that kids that were older than I was playing drums, how much difficulty, were, difficulty they were having doing certain things. And I looked at them, and it was easy for me. So that made me, uh, I felt good about that. Mm -hmm. You know, because I could accomplish things real fast that it was, they were having a lot of problems with. Uh, and then I had a, I have a, I had, now he's passed away, a cousin that he played drums very well. He didn't come to New York. If he'd have came to New York in the 40s, he would have been very well known. His name was Clarence Stamps. But uh, uh, he didn't, and uh, he started teaching me. And he taught me, I learned a lot from him. That's how I really started getting together, was him teaching me these things. Yeah. Was there a point, let's say in high school, that you decided that you were going to be a musician for a living? Uh, yes, yes. I say I was about 15. I had been playing before then, but by the time of 15, I knew that uh, that was what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. was play. And was this time you played with Youssef Latif? Yes, I, well, I, I was, uh, I've been playing much before then. Actually, I had my own group. One day, my mother sent me to uh, help this lady wash her windows. So I went over, and uh, this lady, her husband, was managing a, a, night, a, a teenage club. So uh, we had got in this conversation, and so he, I told him I had a group, so he hired me to bring a group, and that's when I started. But I was playing before then, little dances, and they used yeah. to have, uh, what do you call it, a street dances, where they would block off the street, mm -hmm. and people would, things like that, and at school I played. But when I first started putting the band together was then. I played at a teenage club in Detroit, and uh, I was about maybe 15 or 16 then. And then from there, uh, in Detroit, was it was so, uh, it was a, a, it was a very competitive place, and the older musicians were so they were sort of on a high such a high level. The guys that I was looking at, the musicians that I was uh, looking at, like uh, Tommy Flanagan and and like uh, uh, I said, Yusuf and and uh, so many of them, Kenny mm -hmm. Burrell. Uh, but they didn't know I, they didn't, they didn't realize that I played drums though because I never would play around them. I had my own uh, compadres that yeah. I was beating up on. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, I played at a couple of teenage clubs. Then with Yusuf, I was working in this club, nightclub, and I wasn't supposed to be in the club because you was a person, you're supposed to be 21 to work in nightclubs, and I was about 17, 18. But this club owner, he liked me a, a, a lot. So when Yusuf got the job, he, he said to Yusuf, you can have the job, but Lewis Hayes, you have to take Lewis oh, with the job. Nice. Yusuf didn't know me at the time. Oh. So he came over to my, my mother's house, I was staying with at the time, and says, uh, you got the job, but I'm gonna give you a six weeks trial, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Six weeks, yeah. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. So that was uh, Yusuf and Curtis Fuller was playing trombone and Hugh Lawson the piano and Ernie Farrell was the bassist. And we went in, I went in with them and I had a wonderful, that was a wonderful learning period until they found out how old I was eventually. Oh. <laughs> and then I, that was the end of that job. But right after that, I had another job in another club. But after that, I was, uh, in this place called uh, the West End, which was a place in Detroit that uh, guys, it was an after hour place. And Kenny Burrell actually, his wife, his wife at the time, her name was Laura. And uh, I think it was his first wife. And her family was uh, on this restaurant. And it was an after hour place, a place that had 
good food and a place that musicians came after their job at night, their regular job after two o'clock, and played all night till five or six in the morning. There was another place, I mean, there was, there was a place also that musicians who came from New York and thought they were on such a high level, they would invite them out to this club and uh, unless you were very special, you would get embarrassed out, out uh -huh. there, you know. So I was playing out there this one night, and Kenny Burrell and Doug Watkins, who had left, and they were living here in New York, but they were back home for whatever reason. And we uh, had opportunity to uh, set in and play with them that night. So when they came back to New York, the Jazz Messengers was uh, disbanding, and Horace Silvers was starting his group, and Art Blakey, was keeping the name the Jazz and Messengers, and they were, you know, separating. So Doug was appearing with Horace at the time. So uh, Arthur Taylor was the f original drummer when he first started, but Horace, so I understand, and Arthur, they didn't get along uh, at all. Mm. Too great together. So Doug Watkins says, "Well, uh, I know a person. Let's get the baby boy out of Detroit." Oh. <laughs> so Horace called me. And uh, I thought one of my buddies were playing a little joke on me, you know. So <laughs> I didn't think it was really Horace Silvers calling me up, you know. Yeah. I, was, well, I was 19 years old, I didn't think he was calling me up. Uh, but he, it was Horace, so that's how I, uh, I was in 56, in August of 56. So that's how I first came to New York. Mm. And you have, Played, well, you played on Sister Sadie with him. Yes. And uh, all the great tunes over the years. Um, was his style semi-funky at the time, something that you had experienced before or have any trouble assimilating to? Now, Horace, um, I learned so much from him, but we, uh, we were in tune and it wasn't any problem from the beginning. It was a very comfortable, very relaxed, uh, he would, we would rehearse at his apartment, and he had these different albums uh, that he asked me to listen to, and that was a uh, very uh, experience because these albums that I was had, he asked me to listen to, Art Blakey was on, and so that was a big challenge for me listening to Art Blakey, and that was what I was supposed to replace. But uh, the horse was very easy going and I really didn't have, I, I wasn't uncomfortable at all. It took me actually a little time to really, really uh, start growing, uh, become a, uh, where I was, uh, was able to get strong enough really to be, feel comfortable handling things. With Horace, the, the album at the time they called him, I could really see my growth in the albums that I've made with Horace. I could really tell, but you know, from the first one until I did five with him before I left in 59. Mm -hmm. And I could really tell my, see my growth and listen and hear my growth when I, when I was appearing with Horace. Yeah. You went on to play with, with whom I, when I consider the great, one of the great saxophones of all time. And, Cannonball and record some of Nat's great tunes. Yes. And, and, uh, how did that gig come about? Well, in, in the original Birdland on 52nd Street, uh, I don't remember which night it was, but every week it was a like a session night. Monday night or one of those nights like that. So this night, I was appearing there with... Uh, Hank Mobley, tenor saxophone, and uh, book a little trumpet, Bobby Timmons bass and Sam Jones, Bobby Timmons piano and mm -hmm. Sam Jones bass. And Sam in, was uh, in Cannon's first group. So Sam, we uh, was having, we had a very nice time. And Sam and myself, that was the first time we had, we played together, but we were very compatible. So Sam asked me, um, would I, consider joining Cannonball's band. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about it. So we went, went back and forth between, because with Horace, it, 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 we were so close 
and the band at the time was, we were very comfortable with, with each other. Because I thought, you know, after a period of time, that's what happens. But I was considering making a change. I was young and I was thinking about doing something else. Uh, so that sounded very interesting to me. So eventually I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm very glad that I made the change. That was another experience in Cannonball and Nat and Sam and myself, we became such good friends and we were so close musically and we were on stage and off. I mean, the best of friends, we hung out all the time. And with Cannon, we got to be so close. I mean, with that group, it was like a family. Uh, it was, we, we, we were together all the time. Even when we came home, when we came back to New York, when we had parties, the band was the first one that was, ones that was invited, the right. band, band and their families. That's what we played with and we partied with between the record company who was on Orrin Keep News at the time and John Levy was taking care of the management pup business. So we were just that close, that kind of a group. I know Miles used to ask me every once in a while to join his, come and join his group at that time. And I really wanted to, you know, Miles Davis. <laughs> but uh, I couldn't do that because Cannonball and Nat and it was, it was, we just were too close. Wow. Did the band rehearse at all? Yes, we rehearsed. Yeah, you, but it wasn't like Horace, though. Now, Horace rehearsed quite a bit. Uh -huh. And when he went into the studio, Horace, uh, we had played the courses, the, played the compositions. So all the little things were worked out, yeah. what we were going to do. But with Cannon, it wasn't like that. Cannon was more spontaneous. It was, we rehearsed. We had it together, but everybody was so talented. We didn't, we didn't, it was more spontaneous. We didn't yeah. rehearse all the time like that. Did you have a feeling when you did uh, some of the tunes like Work Song and Jive Samba that, that these were going to be hits? I'm not sure how you define a hit in the, in the jazz world, but yes. um, did, they, you know, did you go away with a feeling like, man, we got something there? No, I, I didn't. And sometimes, I know myself sometimes, I enjoyed my playing, you know, good music, I always enjoyed, especially when you're playing with creative people like Cannon and Nat and, and then Yusuf and Charles Lloyd and Sam Jones. But sometimes I didn't, I thought the stuff was kind of square, especially the work song. Uh-huh. You thought it was square, yeah. <laughs> I mean, especially, you know. You, know. <laughs> you want me to go bump, bump? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't feel like, I mean, this is, I mean, you know, we have to play this every night. Doggone it. <laughs> That's great to hear. You know? I mean, it's, you just never know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, I was much younger, and I, I wanted to be, you know, I'm trying my best to be as creative as possible. And some of those things, you know, I had to learn uh, about business. Music is a business. Mm -hmm. And some of those, I had to, you know, kind of, start getting that together and learning about that because I was looking at it, you know, just for fun and being creative. And I wasn't looking at things that way a lot of times at that, mm. you know, yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, so that's a learning experience in itself. Yes. If you want to be successful, sometimes you can't play exactly the way you had envisioned. Yes. At certain times, I at guess. At certain times. Yeah. Yes. Can you tell me um, anything about this album? Was there anything that Cannonball and Nancy that stuck out in your memory at all? Well, this was another thing that just, uh, well, I would say that uh, Nancy being from uh, Ohio, I think it's Columbus, it was a club there, had some numbers, like 502 or something like that. And I had appeared there with Horace Silvers, and actually in 58 or something like that time. And I met Nancy there. And Cannon had appeared there also with Miles Davis. And he knew Nancy Wilson. And they got to be close during that time. So when Nancy came to New York, she got in touch with Cannonball. And she became very close with Cannonball and Nat and Nat's wife, Ann. They became very close. So, uh, this record date uh, was something where it, it, it uh, we didn't rehearse a lot during this date. 
we, we put together things, we put, most, we put this together in the studio mm -hmm. most of the time, we didn't have a big rehearsal, and just came together, but it was so comfortable that uh, it was another person in Chicago, a, G, a disc jockey, his name was Sid McCoy, and uh, Daddy O, Daddy, Daddy O, something, there was two of them, but Sid McCoy especially. Mm -hmm. We all were very close, and uh, Sid McCoy really uh, played this album a lot, and Cannonball and Nancy, we, we had such a rapport, and people, this, is, this was the album that just uh, took off, and everybody loved it. And uh, so we, we did a lot of concerts together, mm -hmm. places Cannonball and, and Nancy. And it started out, it was amazing, it started out like that, Cannonball and Nancy. We did a lot of things together, we had a great time, a lot of history. But then I noticed the sign changed to Nancy Wilson Cannonball. That's what was, you know, very interesting. But, uh, yeah, uh, that was the relationship with Nancy. Uh, that was a, a wonderful, great relationship. Yeah, it was tight, tight arrangements, you know, even though you say that they were a bit spontaneous. But, yeah. I mean, you could tell that you and Sam yeah. were like this. Right. What was it, uh, Joe Zavino replaced Bobby Timmons? No, or no. I think he replaced uh, Victor Feldman. Uh huh. And Winton Kelly was in there somewhere. Winton Kelly was, but he wasn't actually with the group. But uh -huh. we we uh, recorded together on. Uh, I can't recall the name of uh, the album at the time, but we did record together. I think Bobby Timmons was the original pianist, and then. Uh, Barry Harris was there, that's right. Barry Harris was there for a period of time. And then uh, Victor Feldman. And then really the major pianist was Joe Zavano. He was there for the rest of the door. He was there for years, at least 10 years. Yeah, yeah. What was he like to work with? Uh, Joe was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Joe, actually, Joe was, uh, when he first joined the band, Joe was kind of nervous because he hadn't been in that situation before. He had been appearing with Dinah Washington, mm -hmm. which was uh, Joe's, uh, his facilities were marvelous, but that was a little different company of vocalists, naturally. Right. But this was uh, with Cannonball, it was everybody, every person for herself. You had to be very creative, as you know, I mean, you, know, <laughs> you had to be, everybody's on their own. So, Sam and myself, we used to have these meetings because we were so close, you know, friends. So we would have these meetings and sit in the room at night after the job and discuss these things. And and that's and, and uh, Joe, you know, like I said he was a little a little nervous at first, but he it worked out just uh -huh. wonderful. Worked out just fine. Good writer. Oh, it's it's great. <laughs> Great. And a marvelous, interesting person. He's from Vienna. Yeah. And, and uh, it's sort of his, his, uh, him as a person shows a very, uh, we got along so well together. Mm -hmm. We were very close, good friends. Right. Well, you went from there to kind of a different situation with, yes. with Oscar Peterson. Yes. How did the piano trio a differ from the Cannonball well, thing? that was, uh, for me, a, uh, Oscar being the, the uh, on the highest level a person can be on, on this art form, you know, Oscar was, uh, and he was like that, he was very consistent, like that every night, and he's such a, uh, everything is such, is so great with Oscar, him as a person, the way he carried the trio, uh, being around, being in his company, and everything was, uh, was a great experience. But I wasn't as uh, comfortable with Oscar as I was with Horace, our canon, because with Horace and canon, it was horns, and I had my freedom to be creative and then play and then do exactly what I wanted to do at all times. Mm. It was never, I had no restrictions on me at all with Horace, our canon. Anything that I felt like doing, Go for it. 
you know? <laughs> I mean, just do what you feel like, please, uh -huh. you know? But with Oscar, it was more or less like, uh, how should I put this, star co-star mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. Where he was in, uh, he was uh, leading, and he wanted, you to, wanted the rhythm section to accompany him a certain way. So that was more of a problem for me. Mm -hmm because for the first time I had these restrictions. And that, I mean, playing with him was a great experience, but that did, I feel, felt uh, limit my creativity to a point. So it was harder for me to deal with Oscar because it was, uh, it was so demanding, but then again, uh, I had to really uh, think about um, what I was doing more. Yeah, and, and that, that maybe I have to limit yeah. some things that I exactly. like to do. Right. Mm. Yes. Did this uh, have any uh, play on the fact that shortly after that you became a co-leader and a leading your own groups? Yes. You said like... Because I, I, I uh, with Oscar, I but I, I did it twice. Went back there. When the first time after Cannon was uh, 65, 65, and I went with him again, and I think something like 71, 72, or something around that time. But before, now Freddie Hubbard and myself, we were very good friends. We were the same age, so we lived in the same building in Brooklyn. So we were creating, he was upstairs and I was downstairs. So we were with each other and, and, and recreating and, and uh, making music all the time. So w that was something that I was really was enjoying doing at the time. And actually playing with Oscar was, that's where I was, uh, that was my job. But with Freddie, mm -hmm. we were so having so much fun and so creative. I wasn't making that much money with Freddie, but, we, yes, <laughs> but yeah. we, were, we were making the history. We were having a lot of fun with Freddie Hubbard. So I was doing that all the time, and we had this group we had, we called it the Communicators. It was Freddie Hubbard, and Joe Henderson, and Kenny Barron, pianist, and, uh, and uh, Herbie Lewis was the bassist originally. So Freddie and myself, we, over the years, we played together for all these years, and we still doing it. Uh, so we, that's what I was doing, but after that, uh, it was uh, Cita Walton, who lived around the corner uh, in Brooklyn from us, and he had been in Europe with uh, his quartet. And when he came back, he said to me one day that this person from Holland, whose name was Wim Witt, uh, asked him about me bringing a group over. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I didn't have a group. So I put one together. I got Junior Cook and uh, and Ronnie Matthews and Stafford James, and then we got Woody Shaw. So it was the Lewis Hayes Jr. Cook, Cook Quintet featuring Woody Shaw, and that's the way that came about. Uh -huh. And uh, and I got this also. I knew this lady. Her name was uh, Maxine Craig at the time, who eventually was uh, Maxine uh, 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 Gordon, uh, uh -huh. Dexter Gordon's wife. Oh. But she, she was managing, and we went to Europe, and that's how I started uh, having my own bands. That was the first one. Was it a different experience to be making decisions? And what kind of decisions did, did you have to make as, as leader? Well, uh, this, musically, uh, I was uh, in there making decisions. and just, I, I felt very comfortable doing that. Uh, in that in that role, I felt I always felt comfortable with the guys, and they felt comfortable with me. And I had this lady, you know, trying to a management team. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the problems is I, I feel is uh, actually working all the time is a major problem. But uh, in that situation, situation, everybody. Uh, really getting along. It seems like it's very hard sometimes to get a group where everybody's really compatible mm -hmm. over a long period of time. 
because people, we were young, and people have these different ideas about things and directions they want to they want to go in, and uh, so, so that that can cause different things to make make everybody makes changes. So that's what happened. We were together for a period of time, and then it was time for uh, to make a change. So Woody got his own group, and and uh, I made a change and got a quartet at the time with Frank Strozier and Harold Mayburn and Stafford James stayed there for a period of time. And we, and now that quartet, both things were very creative. I enjoyed the, the group with Junior and Woody and Woody was, and Junior, Woody is so talented. Woody Shaw, boy, he was such a great player. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he uh, recorded this tune that I had written for my wife entitled Nisha. And he played it so beautifully. I mean, that's one of my favorite things by Woody. And and with Frank Strozier, he was so talented as that group. I mean, he's just. But that group, well, I felt like that group should have really taken off. But business, for some reason, wasn't taken care of right with no. that one. So eventually, it just we disbanded that. It, it yeah. came apart. I'm curious, in the, this was mid-60s? Yeah, no, this was into the 70s. Okay. Um, was, was it kind of a tough decade for jazz, wasn't it? Exactly right. Yeah, and there was a lot of different things happening. Of course, you had come out of Coltrane, and you had some free jazz, and you had soul jazz. Did, did, you, did this band have a definition of what you played so when your manager went to try to find work for you, I guess what I'm trying to say is, did you label yourself? No, we didn't label ourselves. But we were, uh, the group with the quartet with Frank and Harold, we were so actually dynamic and so much power that we knew that, you know, we had this ability to perform on such a level that we felt like this is it. This should work. <laughs> but because when we would appear opposite anyone, they were in we serious trouble. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the group was very <laughs> dynamic. It was uh, Harold Mayburn. It was I mean, something to look at, and and and, and he was so percussive. Yeah. And Frank played. I mean, Frank is so knowledgeable on that saxophone. And so when that group broke up, Frank was so disappointed. He stopped playing. Mm. And he started playing piano, and naturally he was a, a school teacher, so he was teaching school, and he was trying to get out of that teaching school thing. And he went back to teaching. He was so dis went back to teaching school. He was so disappointed, so he just and he has he gave music up, but he started playing the piano. And actually, that was in the I think the late seventies or eighties, something in the early eighties or seventies. And he hasn't. I don't think he's ever really got the saxophone and, and, and I played again since then. Mm. He was very disappointed. Yeah, it's too bad. Uh, yes. Well, you re uh, recorded some marvelous records, you and Woody, and uh, I wanted to read a quote that, that someone wrote about you in one of the, the jazz encyclopedia type things, see if you think this is, sums you up. It says, Lewis Hayes plays in a compelling, forceful style marked by a tendency to push the beat and to goad the soloists with frequent fills. Yeah, that's, I, okay. I, yes. That's, All right, good. Yes, I feel great about that. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, because I came up in a way the way I felt. I, I, I like being a, a companyist, but I like doing it on my terms. Mm -hmm. So, because it's... Uh, this art form, I always wanted to play it. One of the reasons is because you can accompany a person, but you can uh, uh, be your own person. You have your own voice in doing that. So that's what I really, uh, one of the things I've always, uh, I mean, wonderful things about this art form, you can get your own voice. You can have your own voice, mm -hmm. and that is one of the main things you, that you, are therefore to do things your own way. Yeah. So being able to accompany people, I mean, soloing was something that 
that's something that I have facilities and you just have to do being a drummer. Uh, it's take solos and things. But originally, I was more, I was more, I was thinking about uh, accompanying. Uh, that's the way I started out playing. Mm -hmm. Your solo last night in uh, one of the tunes had a great kind of crescendo to it. You know, it, it sounded like you were playing bebop rhythms and, but by the time you were at the, at this impact of almost constant sound it's like, I don't know how you were doing it, but it was nice. Thank you very Good. much. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Um, Dexter Gordon thing, you had that classic album with him, too. That must have been a nice experience. It really was. The Vanguard. Yes, yes. That was, uh, that was a great experience. Ellison and Woody, we had to group that group. And, uh, Mac, and Woody, I mean, excuse me, Dexter was staying in Copenhagen at the time. And also Slide Hamilton was living in, in, in Europe. So uh, this lady, Maxine, she uh, talked to him about coming back to New York at the time, and, they, uh, and Dexter wanted to do that. But he didn't have a group. So when this was, when they put that together on, what was it, Columbia? That album? I think it was, Col yeah. Columbia. Uh, Dexter just we made this at the, live at the Vanguard, and actually that was uh, Lewis Hayes' Woody Shaw group. But uh, you know, we just Dexter, you know, and Dexter, people was people were uh, so uh, such a big thing for Dexter to come back, you mm -hmm. know, and so and then, so I mean the club was just uh, packed every night, and it was such a warm feeling. It was a great experience, and we did some more things with Dexter during that time. But that I'm glad I had opportunity to make that history yeah. with Dexter at the time. He certainly had a persona to him. Oh, he had. Oh, that's, that's for sure. Spoke and just his his movements. And exactly all that. right. Yeah. Dexter was one of a kind. That's for sure. Wow. <laughs> Do you have any opinions about the jazz scene today? Well, I I uh, feel like. Uh, it's a little more difficult, I feel, for young artists to come here and get that experience uh, working with bands that have great leaders. During when I came along, I mean, I, you know, everybody feels, you know, you have to come along whenever you're born, but uh, I feel like during that time it was still the last of it, but it was still uh, a time where they had a few bands out here that had great leaders, and you could mm -hmm. go from one band to another band and get that experience. Uh, now, speaking to like a person that was my uh, mentor, Joe Jones, Papa Joe, who came with Count Basie here, uh, speaking, talking to him, and, and him speaking to me actually, when he came here in the 30s with Count Basie, that was the greatest time of all. Now, at least, in, I mean, you know, the big band, and I know he used to tell me when they, you want to see, hear some musicians playing, he said when they had those dancing girls in front of the band, he said the guys were really performing during that time. <laughs> but uh, when I came, it still, you know, it was, a, it was a, the big band era had passed, passed, but they still had a lot of uh, major leaders mm -hmm. that you could play with and you learn during that time. But now, you don't have a lot of, you don't have groups that have this fantastic and, and leaders on a high level like you, like during that time. So the record companies, they take young guys and uh, give them these contracts and make leaders out of people that I don't think are ready to be leaders. Yeah. So it, it actually, to me, it, it uh, makes, it, it uh, People, a lot of, a lot of times, you, they're too young to have really a strong direction. So, to me, it, it starts lowering, lowering the, the creativity and the art form. Because you're, they, they are making, and they, they are, pe certain, and they're looking, they're looking over a lot of people that are still able to really perform on a, on a level there, and they're just going for the youngsters. Mm -hmm. uh, younger musicians, and I think that that is really uh, to a point hurting 
the art form because it's giving people, uh, putting people in positions of uh, that they shouldn't be in. Right. It's a marketing ploy almost. Yes, and yes. It's not honoring the music exactly as much as it should. Yes, yes. Hmm. Yes, so I think that is uh, causing a little problem there. And I guess there's, there's a number of clubs in the, his, not what it used to be. It must be a little harder to, how do you f find work? Well, at this point, um, I'm, I, I do several things, but mainly, I have a group and a uh, quintet, and we just recorded two CDs on a label, uh, TCB, a label out of Switzerland. And one is coming out March 14th, and another one, I'm not sure exactly when they're going to re-release that one. And I have this management team, uh, the person that books Basil's, James Brown, and uh, Martha Barretts, who uh, they are. That's my management team. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm basically involved with my group, and I'm having a wonderful time with that, and uh, it's growing. So that's my main concern, what I'm dealing with right now, is mm -hmm. that quintet. Who's in the, the group? Um, Riley Mullins is the trumpeter, and Abraham Burton. He's tenor, plays tenor saxophone, and Santi. Santi Debriano, he's the bassist, and Dave Hazeltine, he's the pianist. Mm -hmm. Are you the most experienced guy in the band? I'm the oldest yeah. and the most experienced, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was the baby boy, that's what, that's what yeah, changes right. up. You know, in time, as time goes on, it changes. <laughs> wow. Um, I had one little piece of music to play here. Oh, that's something I just mentioned to, to the little yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, as a composer, do you sit at the piano and no, actually, things? I wish I could actually, because I, but my piano, uh, I, I my piano facilities are not that great, so. I put this tune together uh, in my head, and I sang it in a tape recorder. I love that. It's great. Yeah. And it gave me, I mean, that was a job. Mm. I mean, I, I had this record date, so I had to, th I wanted, I had to think of something. And, and my wife and myself, and that's, we were close as could be, you know, as could be. And, but sometimes, we would go, we would have little problems as men and women, you know, mm -hmm. being married does. Yeah. So I'm trying to do something and think of something to get me out of, help get me out of this on the good side. So <laughs> I had to think of this, I had to write this composition and dedicate it to my wife, very important. Yeah. So I sat there on the couch and I started putting this together. And I put it together, and after I got it in my head, and I sang it in uh, this machine, I went to the pianist, the pianist at the time, Ronnie Matthews, mm -hmm. and I explained it to him, and and he made music out of it, put the changes, chord changes to it, yep. and uh, that's how it came about. It's great. I don't wish any more arguments on you, but you know, <laughs> if they come up with tunes. <laughs> Maybe yes. the good times could lead to a tune, too. Yeah, my wife, after she heard it, she said, no, you didn't write it. You didn't write that. So I had to go and get that original uh, singing and whistling I was doing. I had to <laughs> That's great to have, though. Yes. Here's where it you know, came from this kind of raw inspiration and yes. what came out of it. Yes. So actually, after that, she bought me uh, this little little thing that uh, this little machine that I can just click it on and when I have an idea just yep. sing right into it. Yeah, great, good story. Yes. <laughs> you uh, like playing overseas? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, 
I think it's changed over the years. And I, I well, I, I say it like this. Overseas, I was working with my, especially with my groups, more so than in America or any place else. I was dealing in, in Europe uh, more than any place. Because we would go for long periods of time, six weeks. And I had, a, I had quite a few groups that I've taken over there over the years. Mm -hmm. I had this person that was, I was uh, booking me over there quite a bit. But I got, uh, I got to the point where the venues that I was uh, playing in, I got to the point where I didn't feel like doing that anymore. Playing in clubs, I wanted to do more concerts and things. And I got kind of uh, to the point where I, I'd done these other things so much that I just didn't want to do it anymore. So I just stopped going over. I haven't been going over lately. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going back this, this summer coming up because the, uh, my management team and the record company have put some things together, but they are festivals. Uh, so I'm going over and do about four festivals uh, in this, this summer mm -hmm. coming up. And I'd like that, that much more. Great. Just to uh, wrap up here, because I know I have to go to work, do uh, you have any words of advice from, you know, for a musician just graduated from Berkeley and wants to be enmesh enmeshed in the jazz world? Well, I, I feel that uh, if you, if you are, uh, uh, you know, you know you're good at what you do, it's, uh, it's just something where it just takes being uh, uh, you find your you'll find your way. Everybody, you know, if you, if you uh, can, I always said if you're able to come to New York uh, and be around for a while, you'll find uh, just where how you fit in because mm -hmm. there's so many different scenes. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's just a matter of time. And if you have the talent, I don't think it, should, it, would, it would be anything. And you know that's what you want to do. I think a lot of people are just, they're not sure of what they want to do. Yeah. But when you really feel it, you will survive. You will make it. Mm -hmm. you got to be willing to pay some dues. Yes, <laughs> yes. And that, and that uh, you know, that can be... Uh, Dues can be, you know, what they call it, can be very, very, uh, uh, very positive, especially when you. Uh, I know when I came, I, you know, it's, it's, I didn't have any uh, responsibilities, no wife and kids, anything like that. So I was free to be able to make mistakes and do things and be with my peers. But when you get to the point where you have a family, now that's when it can be a problem. Is that's dues? I feel yeah. if, if you get. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing if you're hungry. Right. It's something else. <laughs> that's right. That's a, that's, that's a serious responsibility there. Right. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, I wish you best of luck with your, your band and the new CDs coming out and everything in the future. Thank you very much, Mark. It was my pleasure. Right. Thank Thanks you. a lot.